Newton Heath only avoided relegation by beating Small Heath, the infant Birmingham City, in a playoff. The drop was postponed for just one season, though. Bringing up the rear again, they disappeared into the second division for the next 12 seasons. But just after the turn of the century, the club's problems were financial. In 1901, a fundraising bazaar was organised. He, he was uh, a wealthy brewer. He, and Davis was told of the club's plight, and he came to the rescue. It was the support of one J.H. Davis and his friends that spared Newton Heath from a winding up order in 1902. The players' wages were due, and £2,000 had to be raised. Davis became the new president, demanding a new approach and a new name. But whisper it, this was very much Manchester's second team. Rival City were already a top-flight side. They had won the cup. In 1906, Magnell paid £500 for their star turn, the charismatic Billy Meredith. Banned in bribery and illegal payment scandals, but an irresistibly magnetic force who was to prove something of a Pied Piper. Britain's best fullback Herbert Burgess followed him across town, along with striker Jimmy Bannister. Acquisition Sandy Turnbull, a cup winner with City, the scorer of the cup winner for United in 1909. In February 1910, the club moved to Old Trafford, a new stadium financed by J.H. Davis, who had plunged a massive £60,000 into the project. This was United in their second championship season at home to Newcastle. It was the climax of the Magnol era, and it was to be the club's last title for more than 40 years. It had been a modest spell for the club, three seasons spent in the second division, promotion in 1925 offering only brief encouragement. It was one of the more unfashionable spells in their history. The 1930s were a decade of depression for United. After losing their first 12 games of the season, they plummeted back into Division 2. The supporters had seen enough. They vowed to boycott the home match with Arsenal. 3,000 or more squeezed into a public protest meeting. For the final fixture of that relegation season, less than 4,000 turned up at Old Trafford. But again, there was a man for the crisis. James W. Gibson, a textile magnate who pledged more than £30,000 to save United from going to the wall. Swept aside the old board of directors and became chairman himself, carrying favour with press and public alike and launching an appeal for a further £20,000 in return for a guarantee of a fresh start for the club. Just as J.H. Davis had saved the day 30 years earlier, J.W. Gibson emerged as United's knight in shining armour. For the long-suffering fans, anyone would do. But it got worse before it got better. Relegation had become an occupational hazard, and despite the appointment of Scott Duncan as manager, the class of 1934 actually flirted with demotion to the third division. United stayed in the second division, just, but in the very same week, City, with one Matt Busby in their team, were winning the FA Cup. <laughs> was there still a, a glamour, a mystique about Manchester United then, or they, was no, it just run of the mill no. side? In fact, they had a nickname called the Rags in those days. What was it like then, Old Trafford? Well, it was nothing like it is today. I mean, the crowds was roughly about 20,000. Uh, the atmosphere is totally different. I mean, there's no singing and chanting. 1936, another false dawn. Champions of the second division, the first trophy for 25 years. 1937, instant relegation and in a Manchester City championship season. As long as the heart of the North continues to beat, but she will remember its glories too. The selfless service and dauntless courage with which her people met their hour of trial. March 1941, and German bombs aimed at the Trafford Park industrial estate blitz the United ground. It would be eight years before football could be played there again. Manchester's bomb-scarred Old Trafford ground. Home of great matches of the past, Old Trafford reckons on a bumper coming season for Manchester United. And way up on the terraces, the wartime weeds haven't long to live. In the interim, United came to an agreement with their neighbours to play their home matches at Main Road, paying City around £5,000 a year for the privilege. It was here, on enemy territory, that a United dynasty was born. Matt Busby was no stranger to Main Road, of course, 
As a 17-year-old, he was about to join the rest of his family and emigrate to America when City invited him to come south instead. Busby became captain of City, winning his FA Cup medal in 1934. Matt Busby's a man, I know him personally. I wanted him as a player when he played for Manchester City, but we couldn't raise the £150 that Peter Hodge, the manager of City, asked for Busby. And so on the 19th of February 1945, Company Sergeant Major Instructor Matt Busby put pen to paper. At 34, he inherited a first division club with no ground, no training facilities and debts of £15,000. I was a bit in awe because, to start with, I wasn't a United supporter, I was a City supporter. There was only one team in Manchester then, and the, Man the City team of Swiftdale, Barkas, Busby, Busby Cow and Bray, uh, Toseland, Hurd, Tilson, Doty and Brute were my heroes, and to have Matt Busby here was uh, fantastic for me.